bad. <laughs> cool. It is on. Oh, there's a whole stage and everything. Hey, you. Jesus Christ. Valley thinks the 8, Luxanne thinks the 98, <laughs> and Buja thinks 52, and Poon thinks 52. Cosplayers? Haggy Waggy? You see me in the crowd? Right. My clone. <clears throat> Una minuta, remember to link your account if you haven't, if you want the drops. I get the drops, right? Surely I do. Yeah, because hey, I've linked my accounts. So I do still have drops, because I'm watching it, yeah. Arc Dark thanks to five years. How do you link account? Uh, go to your Path of Exile account in the website, and then it just says connections there. I do have drops, yeah. They're on. They are enabled. Uh... Yeah, you might need to refresh for it. You're still gonna get it, you don't need to refresh. Hey guys, how's it going? Perry in here. Oh! And Creep oh! To ExileCon! <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us here in New Zealand. It's quite a journey. Thank you guys for joining us online. It's going to be a fantastic show. Um, so uh, you guys want to learn about what's coming up in Path of Exile? Yeah! Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, before we get to the people that are best to deliver that information, before we get into Path of Exile's wonderful future, let's take a moment to go over all the wonderful things we have already experienced in Path of Exile. Let's take a moment. I remember when he beat the Avalon in Inferno. From the past. That was so sick. Unreleased uh, internal trailer 2010. Life is fleeting. Hey, you, a worthy opponent. Go with God. The touch of God! Bow to your queen, mortal! You there, let me bend your hair for a moment. Why are you so in love with death? Not really sure where to go. I'll go bottom left for now. What in damnation have you done? I'm gonna lower my lights. When my PC is to run the game, can't run it now.
The end game bosses in this game look nuts. To the Grove Exile, a harvest awaits. This one should be rather legitimate. I played a bit in this There's one, I think. Toy wish to play with me. Your path to greatness has taken a hard turn toward a cliff. Detonations incoming! There's no time. I've become too weak to sustain the blood cruise. Scourge. Oh yeah, these are super bosses, right? Or Calandra. Yeah, Ubers, Ubers. You cannot escape that gaze. I think this is what we saw, though. Agarat teaser? Oh, okay. The other four devs are shitting their pants right now. Hi, I'm Chris Wilson from Grinding Gear Games. <laughs> Is he the president of it? Welcome to ExileCon 2023. Yeah. It CEO, feels like yeah. just yesterday that I was here on stage at ExileCon 2019 announcing Path of Exile 2. Since then, we have worked tirelessly on the content we're going to show you this weekend. To everyone here in person, thank you so much for coming out to join us. It honestly feels so good to know that people love Path of Exile so much that they fly across the world to come and celebrate it with us in person here. I really hope you have a great trip and make the most of your time in New Zealand. Our last ExileCon was a magical experience, and we've tried to go above and beyond in every way this time. If you're tuning in online to watch the live stream, thanks for joining us also. I wish you could all be with us here, but to ensure you have the full ExileCon experience, we have made sure to include every talk and session as part of the two-day live stream this weekend. Twitch drops are enabled for the live stream, but if you're here in the audience, you'll automatically get them when you redeem the microtransaction code in your swag bag, so no need to stream it from your phones while you're watching. Uh. <laughs> you'll also receive the attendee-only ExileCon 2023 hideout. We have so much to share with you this weekend, and let's just get right into Path of Exile 2. I'd no, like just to for today, Jonathan Rogers and Mark Roberts, game directors of Path of Exile 2. Hey guys. While Chris has been running Path of Exile 1, Mark and I and over 100 other developers have been hard at work on PoE 2. Jesus. And honestly, the project has become much bigger than we expected when we announced it in 2019. It's been almost four years since then, and so it's about time we showed you what we've been working on. Oh, hang on. Why not? <laughs> Okay. When we, sorry, I forgot that. Okay. When we announced Path of Exile 2 at ExileCon 2019, we told you guys that we were releasing it as an expansion to PoE 1 and that both campaigns would be playable in the same game client at a, at, with a shared endgame. But PoE 2's scope has continued to grow and grow, and it's far more than just an expansion with a new campaign. It has entirely new monsters, skills, mechanics, classes, everything you'd expect from the next generation of action RPGs. Not to mention revamps of most of the PoE 1 League content. This thing is just freaking huge. There was a point where we realized that our plan to replace PoE 1 with PoE 2 would essentially be getting rid of a game that people love for no real reason. So we made a decision. 
Path of Exile 1 and 2 will be separate with their own mechanics, balance, end games, and leagues. But it's still a shared platform. Your microtransactions are available across both games. Everything you have ever purchased or will ever purchase in the future will be usable in both games unless it's hyper-specific to the content of one of them. You can't transform into a bear in POE 1, so a reskin of your bear form isn't going to work. But you absolutely can equip the awesome armor set that you got and use all your stash tabs. So with that in mind, we'd love to show you a live demo of some of the stuff we've been working on. Oh. POE 2 has come a long way. Mark here is going to man the PC. Hopefully he doesn't die. It is a live <laughs> gameplay demo after all. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The gods caused all this, you know. After Aureth was destroyed, I traveled, searching for answers. Everywhere I went, the same divine devastation. It must end. I will end it. And no exile will stop me. Witch. Ranger. Lunatic. Shadow. Cool. Oh, sick bear form. Bear form. Bear form. Hundred bosses, fifteen hundred passive skills, thirty six ascendancy classes. <laughs> oh, my God! Six person co op. This world will be reborn, no matter the cost. Damn. Okay, you. All right, Mark. Your turn now. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Path of Exile 2. We'd like to start off by showing you some of the gameplay of Act 3, one of the six acts in POE 2's campaign. We're starting here in the jungle depths. Act three is set in the ruins of the Vile civilization, which fell thousands of years ago. Jungle has taken over their former once great cities, and we'll be exploring it use, using one of the six new character classes called the Monk. A Monk. In POE one, we had one character class for each of the combinations of strength, dexterity, and intelligence. When looking at the design of POE two, though, we realized that many of the new skills that we were trying to design just didn't really fit thematically with the existing classes that we have. Being a spellcaster with a bear form makes sense for strength int, but it just doesn't really sound like something a Templar would do. We realized that since we had new mechanics for every attribute combination, it actually made sense to design a new character class to avoid the, to explore the new themes. In POE 2, every attribute combination has two classes associated with it. Strength int has the Templar or the Druid. On dexterity, you have the Ranger or the more spear-focused Huntress. And on dex int, you have the Shadow and the Monk, which Mark is playing here. Each class has its own three ascendancies that let you further specialize the class in a way that only that class has access to, but they both start at the same location on the passive tree. 
The quest rewards you are offered on the two variants are tailored to the class, but of course, this is PoE. You can still mix and match anything to your heart's content. <laughs> Looks like we've come across the boss for this area. In PoE 2, every area of the campaign contains a boss of at least this difficulty. That's over 100 bosses to fight as you make your way through the campaign, and they all have unique mechanics. Where's dodge roll? As you've been watching huh. from Mark fighting here, you probably noticed that melee combat in PoE 2 is a very different feel than before. We've done a lot of things to add mobility to combat. Practically every melee skill in PoE 2 has some kind of movement built into it. But the monk in particular is a melee fighter who specializes in mobility over brute strength. As Mark has been playing, you might have noticed these blue markers over enemies. Mark has a skill equipped called Killing Palm. Whenever an enemy has a blue indicator over it, it means that the monster has low enough life to cull with Killing Palm. Successfully executing the cull will give you a power charge. This is an important skill for the monk, since many of his skills interact with power charges. One of the great things about this skill is that it has a built-in dash forward, which makes it much easier to target the skill at right at the point where you need it. We've done a huge amount of work in PoE 2 to make using skills like this feel satisfying. If you're accidentally targeting slightly off the monster, the skill will automatically lock on to the colorable target and it will even do a small amount of pathfinding around obstacles. We really want to make sure that when you've got an opportunity to use the skill, nothing is going to get in your way. One of the, once you have some power charges, you're gonna need some skills to power up. A great follow-up is Falling Thunder. Falling Thunder without a power charge just creates a relatively small lightning AOE in front of you. Oh, look at the burn marks. But if marks. you do it with power nice. charges, it turns into a pack clearer with a large number of extra projectiles. Hey, you. One thing to notice here is that, like almost every melee skill in PoE 2, Falling Thunder has a little bit of extra movement built in just in case you need it. Use the skill within range and you just do the flip in place. If you use it at a larger range and your character will move forward while executing it, getting you into position without any time penalty. In PoE 2, you also get a short period to redirect your target. Notice how you can start the skill facing one way, then whip the mouse sideways to land the skill in a different direction? Now, in order to get power charges, you're gonna first need to get some lower life monsters into a colorable range. You've got a few options if you wanna, if you wanna charge right in. Whirling Assault is great. It doesn't do much damage per hit, but it covers a lot of ground. And notice how you can turn as you do it? Generally speaking, you never lose control of your character in PoE 2. If you make a turn at the right time, you can get a couple of extra hits on the monsters, getting them in range of your cull. Follow up with a killing palm and then finish off the rest of the pack with your falling thunder. We've now entered the Val Mechanarium. This is the place where the Val built the various constructs that they relied on to power their civilization. Now this is a find! A Val ruin that hasn't been looted? I wonder why nobody's been What's in here before. One useful feature we've added is the ability to call in NPCs mind. to where you are to give you more information or help you with quest objectives, rather than always having to go back to town. In this case, we've called in Alva to find out what to do. This mechanism... If powered with a small soul core, it could open that door. There should definitely be soul cores somewhere around here. They had to power these constructs somehow. As Alva just said, we need to find a small soul core to open this door. Let's explore. Get back. If you want to shave off some life without getting too close to some of the more dangerous monsters, a great option is Wind Blast. Wind Blast also doesn't do too much damage, but it keeps enemies back. The closer they are, the farther they're pushed back, so it's a great option for keeping smaller but higher damage enemies at bay. Note that the bigger the enemy is, the less they'll be pushed back, so trying to push back some giants isn't going to be as effective. And there's the soul core. Let's get back to the door. <laughs> Yo. 
You yeah, UI looks about the same. Consider me impressed. I'll keep investigating in here. Bring me in to find anything else. Away! Now, if you need to defeat tougher enemies, it might be time to break out some of the ice skills in the monk's arsenal. Glacial Cascade creates a wave of ice that moves slowly in front of the player. It's pretty ineffective against fast-moving monsters because most of the damage occurs right at the end of the wave, and so a lot of monsters will just walk right by it. But if you can find a way to make a monster stop at just the right place, it can be very effective. In order to do that, you're probably going to want to freeze some monsters. The monk has a few different tools to do this. A fairly, option, a fairly simple option is to get right in the monster's face with oh. Ice Strike. I strike yeah, Path of Exile is free to play, yeah. Hits, but attack three times in sequence, and you can get off a combo that has a much higher chance to freeze. Get in there with the freeze, then roll back and finish the job with Glacial Cascade. Now, remember how Glacial Cascade is that extra damaging spike at the end? If you hit a frozen enemy with that spike, it shatters the ice on the enemy and does a devastating amount of damage. This is a really great combo against bosses. Oh, it, it's not pay to win. Later. This game would not oh, be yeah, as I've popular as it was if it had around. a bad... Did I forget to mention the Imperial Like, if it had, like, pay to win. Every character. Just press space bar There's just no doubt. No way. <laughs> There's, there's no cooldown and no limitations. <laughs> pay to float and, and pay to organize. So you don't get stuck on anything. Yeah, you can buy, <laughs> like, stash or whatever that you can name, right? When you dodge roll, you're not invulnerable. If something hits you, you're going to feel it. But most things aren't going to hit you. And that's because while you're rolling, projectiles and melee strikes will always miss. You'll have to roll out of the way of a slam that has AoE, but anyone swinging a sword or throwing a fireball is going to miss. Now, another important function of dodge roll is it lets you cancel out of any skill at any time. Wait, what? This makes it so you don't feel That's like you're so strong during a long animation when something's about to hit you. It really changes how skills with longer attack and cast times play, and makes dodge roll a very reliable feeling way to avoid attacks. So that's one way to get oh, the out stash of tabs are like one or two dollars. Yeah. So it makes sense that it would have some more. Wave of Frost is one of our new attacks with a retreat built right in. You move backwards and throw out a cold attack with a significant freeze. A great thing about this is that it puts you at a good distance to follow up. Wait, with so a every class has a dodge roll? Surely, right? That's good, yeah. I was just about to say what you said, Johnny, because it's less about just spamming potions and more about, like, timing dodges and stuff then. Stash tabs go on sale pretty frequently, and around $15, $20 will get you most of what you need. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of the good free-to-play games, there's no doubt. Another skill you can use to get some extra freeze is Shattering Palm. Shattering Palm is a palm strike that puts a small ice bomb on the target. Kill or deal enough damage to the target and the bomb will explode, doing some damage and a significant freeze. It's a great option against bosses where the wave of ice you've, might not be enough. You've played for over eight off. years and will spend twenty but bucks. Yeah, really I think I spent get, twenty on the stash tabs. To get the damage bonus. A few years ago. No, actually, I bought skins too. <laughs> I bought skins on stream, I remember. The final right. skill we're going to show you today hey, is Flicker you. Strike. It's a monk skill and another skill that consumes power charges. Yeah, the skins are so good, though. If you've played Peewee 1 before, you know what to expect. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a great finish of a tough boss fight. If you this is worth some trying. Looks kind of fun. If you like ARPGs, uh, Inferno, th this is definitely it. Like Path of Exile can be uh, overwhelming because the skill tree is humongous, humongous. But there's really good guides for like pro, pro from like pro players and everything, and it's it, like it's free to play. You don't even need to. Uh, you can just install and try it. If you don't like it, then yeah. It's build paradise, yeah. Here I level in this. Jack. I have uh, three different characters, but I haven't. I, I like. The I don't play fell, much now. I don't play anymore now. 
In order to take down this boss, we're going to need all the tools on the monk's arsenal, especially the combo of, of Freeze and Glacial Cascade. Now, if you're a PoE 1 player, you might think you can't rely on Freeze because there's so many bosses that are immune to it. But in PoE 2, that's changing significantly. In PoE 1, Freeze is a binary attack. Steam, yeah. An attack freezes the target, or it doesn't. What this basically means is that in PoE 1, we were forced to add Freeze immunity to many bosses because Freeze just trivialized them. Because of that, freezing was something you could only really rely on while pack clearing, and not something you could use as a core part of your build for boss fighting. In PoE 2, though, all crowd control mechanics now have internal meters that allow you to build up to a freeze or stun, or whatever other CC mechanic that you're using. It's a little bit like poise from games like Elden Ring, though the meters tend to be a lot smaller than those games. When you freeze an enemy, it increases the amount of freeze you need to do to get another freeze, but the increased difficulty bleeds away slowly. More freeze will always. Oh, did he actually say Elden Ring? I thought I heard it, but I was like, you will not get out. It will not get out of control <laughs> in party play or interact badly with other CC mechanics, allowing us to let these kinds of mechanics actually work against all bosses. The ring. Ah. I think you're wrong, you too, man. <laughs> you put over a thousand euros into Pile of Excel microtransaction eight years. There you go. Yeah, the cosmetics are very hard, they are. Oh, he's gonna die! Oh, what? What? <laughs> oh, no! Ah. <laughs> Alright. Again, again, again! Let's, uh, take two. <laughs> Alright, so, this might be a good time to mention that uh, in POE 2, if you die to the boss, you have to start again from the start. There's no boss cheesing. <laughs> ah. So hang on. Oh, there might be a. Are you okay? Oh, one, one second. One, one technical one. issue. <laughs> it's just typing some cheats. To, uh... <laughs> Clara. Hey, sports. Thanks, sixty-four. Right, Toons, Connors, <sighs> three months. Park Rose, six twenty-five. Back to the stream. Ruth, thanks for the four-year anniversary. Right. I'm like a three-year anniversary. Thank you, All guys. Right. Round two. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go. Do we ever balance that? Like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's very good he died, yeah. It shows uh, difficulty. <sighs> the dodge roll is such a good addition. That's my favorite thing thus far. Will this be on consoles? I don't know if they've said that yet. Yeah, it's it's so much better than just spamming potions. Dark Souls player take. Yeah, but it like in regular Path of Exile, you basically spam potions and like blink away or run away or whatever. But uh like now, look at this. That, that looks good. It actually looks like things are going to be a bit more challenging with this. Because, just because of the, the dodge roll is there. <laughs> Getting hit by one of those is scary. <laughs> what do you mean, LA gameplay? I would just lash out on this boss, dude, and he'd die. <laughs> Holy. Oh, this is sweaty. He's like half health. 
Okay. Can okay. you still play PoE one nice. after release? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure you can. Yeah, absolutely. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, an F bomb. Does that mean I can curse too? They will update them separately. Yeah. Come on. This is a fight. <laughs> that was good damage. Get greedy now. Get okay. Hey. All right. All right. Second time's the charm. <laughs> so, <laughs> Black Draw has dropped a consumable quest item here called the Flame Core. It's a permanent plus 10 to spirit. And Peewee 2, we really want to make sure that you feel rewarded for exploration. It wouldn't be much good if we made all these awesome optional bosses if we didn't have something great to find for killing them. One of the things you might find for killing a boss is permanent stat bonuses for your character. I wonder what spirit does. Hmm. Give us a release date. Hopefully we do get one. All right, now, because this random uh, area is different, Mark will have to find his way to the exit the hard way. This is, um, <laughs> because I died, this is yep. no longer rehearsed Yeah, they're, they're apparently beta, but I would, I would like a full release date. Oh, yeah, they wouldn't do that now because the show goes for the weekend, right? Ah, true. I'm watching. Have a big cell. Sure does, Rowan. Killing palms more often, Mark. <laughs> Your fate is sealed. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. oh, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, lightning strike. <laughs> oh. I think you got completely lost there. <laughs> I have no does, idea where I am. Does he not use? <laughs> there's no map. He's not using a map. <laughs> All right. Yeah. There we go. All right. Here we are. Here we are. Here's the exit. <laughs> Hardcore play through the dip, bro. People who play hardcore in Path of Exile are nuts, man. You literally die, like, either you melt everything on screen in half a second, and if you die, you die in half a second. It's like... <laughs> yep. All right. There goes Let's my go character. Through. All right. 
Oi. In, uh, in order to help with the next area, we're going to call in a sorceress. I'd like to welcome okay. Octavian to the stage, who's going to join the party with Mark, so we can play through together. People don't really co-op in Path of Exile 1, do they? Alright, one second. Alright. Here we, here we go. We do. All right. Map the sorceress juicing. is the new intelligence focused character Farm parties. in Parties. Well, the witch bar. focuses more on occult magic and summoning. The sorceress is themed around pure elemental destruction. Let's have a look at how she plays. This is the largest soul core I've ever seen. With this, we could power the canal systems. But it isn't charged. There is still latent energy in this machinarium from its ancient operation. These lines in the stonework should lead to generators. You might need to find some more soul cores to spin them up, but everything looks to be in surprisingly decent condition. <coughs> Maybe the golems have been maintaining hey, it. In any case, it should still function. Cruise we'll have for to the remove that large core from the wall, of course, but that shouldn't be a problem. We have some skills here you're probably going to recognize if you've played Pee-Wee One before, but they feel a bit different now. Spark is great in these tight passages since it bounces around. We've added a pierce support gem to really allow it to hit an entire room full of targets. Oh, wow. For a more single target focus skill, Arc is a great choice. It does much more damage than the first target that you hit. Now, if you find yourself surrounded, it might be a good idea to use Ice Nova. It hits all enemies around you and slows Reese. them down with a chill. Just be careful. Getting up close and personal isn't the ideal place for a sorceress to be. She doesn't have the more the defenses of a more melee-oriented character. In order to help with that, though, we could use Arctic Armor. In PoE 2, Arctic Armor is a buff that builds up as you stand still. You can see the ice crystals forming around the character. Huh. They drop off if you walk. Oh, okay. When monsters hit you, they take cold damage and build up to a freeze. So it's a great defense. Just be careful. You have to be standing still for a little while to get the full effect. But so you really don't want to stand. It isn't the best strategy. Yeah. You really don't want to stand now, Arctic still. Arctic Armor is an ongoing buff, but did you notice it didn't reserve any mana? How does that work? Well, we were pretty sick of the fact that in Pee Wee 1, basically every character was playing with no mana pool. So we decided to change the way that reservation works. Okay. In Pee Wee 2, there's a new resource called Spirit. Spirit is a dedicated resource that you can use for ongoing effects like Arctic Armor, Heralds, Auras, and Minions. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> that's a big change here. Yeah. Everyone starts with 100 spirit, which is enough for most ongoing effects. But if you want more, you're going to need to get some more spirit, which is available on mods from items and on the passive tree. But if you're willing to give up your offhand slot, the easiest way to get it is by holding a scepter. Find out more about that in the items talk later on. Okay. Now, if you want to increase the cold damage that you're dealing, you can always use Frost Bomb. It places a bomb on the ground that reduces enemies' cold resistance while it's ticking down. It's a great opportunity to use some cold skills before it explodes. And speaking of cold skills, a great skill to use on monsters with lower cold resistance is Comet. Ooh. This is a new skill in PoE 2 and it hits pretty damn hard. It costs a lot of mana and has a really long cast time, but it's worth the wait. It does a devastating amount of damage. To help you out of danger, your character moves back slightly as it casts. Oh yeah, it's a long it's cast time. It's hard to hit fast moving opponents, but it's great on tougher enemies that stand still, or even a larger pack if you're further away and can predict where they're going to move. Now, if you run out of mana casting too many of those, I guess in an emergency you could use your free to cast fireball. So where did that come from, you ask? Well, this is a great opportunity to explain the way that we've changed caster weapons in PoE 2. Now, in PoE 1, caster weapons had a default melee attack that nobody used. And because they had that, they also had a bunch of attack mods that would spawn in them that were useless to a caster. In PoE 2, we wanted to clean that up. So each staff now comes with a built-in free-to-cast spell. Oh. Huh. Yes. <laughs> Just put it on and spam away to your heart's content. Hmm. Now this particular staff is the base type that you'll get right on the starting beach. So it's quite likely that you'll have outgrown it by now. So that's why we've also um, made a lot of staves with more utility focused powers for casters to use. Here we have a crystal staff. It has a pretty cool built-in spell called Unleash. Using it slams your staff on the ground and will allow you to triple cast whatever you cast with your next spell. 
Now, of oh. course, what you're probably going to want to use with that is something powerful, and Comet is a great option. Oh, oh. <laughs> Jesus. The new. You'll notice that Unleash is one of the few skills in Peewee 2 with a cooldown. In general, we really try to avoid using cooldowns because we really hate the feeling that combat is just waiting to cast your next spell. But it does make sense for Unleash since it's free to cast and it's something we want you to use situationally anyway. Now, if you're facing something tough, you might need to try out Mana Tempest. Mana Tempest creates a circle of power which your character literally hovers over the ground. Uh, there's no banner right well, there, that's your mana drains, but it powers up all your spells. But it's Lightning just on Steam. Will fork, beams will chain further, and you also do a lot more damage. Thanks for asking, though. Comet! Ah, Hi there. So, with all of these skills, here's a great combo to try. First, cast Frost Bomb to reduce the target's cold resistance. Then use Mana Tempest to increase your damage. Follow up with Unleash and then triple cast Comet to do a truly insane amount of damage. Ghosts come from <laughs> these ghosts. <laughs> yes. oh, <I> <laughs> this Whose rare fault is that? <laughs> this rare monster has dropped an uncut gem, and that's a great opportunity to talk about how skill gems drop in PoE 2. Instead of dropping specific gems, you can find uncut gems. Just right-click on them and pick whatever skill you want. What? Nor the uh, whoops. Whoa. whoa, whoa. <laughs> what the hell? The gem, the gem will come pre-leveled to the level of the area that dropped it, so it's a lot easier to change between skills in PoE 2. It's PoE 2, yeah. This time, I think it might be cool to grab one of our meta gems. Meta gems are skills that can have other skills socketed into them, changing how they work. In this case, we're going to select Cast on Shock. Now, let's equip this thing in the skill screen and choose which spell to trigger with it. I think Comet might be fun. Wait, what? Now, because Cast on Shock reserves Spirit, we'll need to first disable our Arctic Armor. We have to decide if we'd rather have the extra defense or the extra offense of the Cast on Shock using our Spark. In PoE 2, Trigger Gems use a system of filling up cast time on each trigger. Basically, if a skill has a short cast time, it will trigger really often. And if it has a long cast time, like this Comet here, it will take a lot longer to trigger. You can see on the top left corner that there's a counter that shows you how long until the next trigger. Okay. Hopefully you shot some monsters. <laughs> there we go. And there you have it. That's using cast on shot. We've automatically cast comment whenever we're using our lightning skills. So, we found the generator. Time to power it up. Power is restored to the Mechanarium, all the constructs are coming back to life. We're going to fight, fight them on the way back to the charged soul core. So, one thing that PoE 1 players might have noticed is this character has both lightning spells and cold spells. That's pretty inefficient, right? It's a big no-no for most builds because any specialization into cold or lightning isn't going to affect the other element. And generic elemental damage increases are not going to be as powerful as focusing on a single element. Well, in PoE 2, we have another major new system to introduce to solve these kinds of problems. And it starts, oddly enough, with Weapon Swap. Now, in PoE 1, Weapon Swap isn't really used much for its originally intended purpose. We imagine that people are going to be swapping in and out between different weapons <laughs> to deal with whatever situation they were in. People just don't do that at all. And a large reason for that is because it's really, really awkward. In PoE 2, we wanted to uh, solve all of that. The staff Octavian is using here has an ice mod on it that makes it great for when he's using his ice spells. But we would also like to be able to make sure that this build works just as well for his lightning spells. If Octavian equips his previous staff in his second weapon set, you can see that it appears on the character's back. Now, uh. we're going to open up the skill screen. If Octavian opens the skill options for his lightning skills, you can see here that you can choose which weapon sets are usable with each skill. First, we uncheck Wait. set one from being used by his lightning skills. 
Then we go through the cold skills and turn those off with his lightning weapon. Wait, what? I'll just take a second. <laughs> if I can remember where they all are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it auto swaps now, when you when cast spark, that spell? The character will automatically switch to the lightning staff on his back and then use the skill. Oh, what? And when Taven uses his ice nova, his character automatically switches to his ice staff before using it. That's, that's so good. That's so good. <laughs> You can configure each skill for which set to use, or both if you don't mind which. There's a very short time penalty to switching, they, so it can be good to leave some skills on both sets if it doesn't matter which weapon set you're using. When but they we still have a problem. Passives. Wouldn't it be nice if we could specialize in both cold and lightning passives on the character? Well, in POE 2, you can. When they mentioned weapon swap, I was like, ah, Hopefully weapon swapping. Well, uh, we do this demo. <laughs> but it's automatic, depending so, on the ability. The skill That's here, so good. And you can see that we are close to both a cold and a lightning cluster. At the top right of the screen, you can see that we have some weapon set specific points to allocate. If Octavian holds shift, he can allocate set one to the cold passives, and then allocate set two to the lightning passives. Oh! Now, <laughs> check it out. As we use our weapon swap, the skills allocate changes from one build to the other automatically. Well, so oh, we what the, the fuck? Spell, the character's passives reconfigure on the fly to the correct build for that spell. Holy! Okay, now, this is actually every nuts. Every single passive on your tree. Only points granted from skill books will allow this kind of dual specialization. So you're not going to be changing from a mace slamming warrior into a fire elementalist with a press of a button. But it certainly increases the number of options you have for builds. There's a huge number of places where the system can shine. You could augment your dagger shadow build with traps, or have a great curse set up on your witch with one spec, and then move to your chaos debuff spells with the other, for example. It really opens up your options. Now, another fun meta gem to try out is called Barrier Invocation. This works a little bit like the trigger gems I talked about before, but this one charges up as your energy shield is hit by monsters. We're going to put an Ice Nova in this one. The more energy shield you lose, the more charge builds up. Let me just get that one equipped there. Yep. Uh, so yeah, the more energy shield you lose, the more charge will build up until the point you're able to cast the socketed skill instantly. There we go. So you, lose some, uh, yeah, so you lose some energy shield, and at just the right time, invoke Ice Nova to cast all the stacked up copies in one instant cast. If you keep losing shield, you'll build up even more charge for even more casts. So it's a great defensive option in an emergency. The whole weapon swap thing is so fucking tight. Pecking tight. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse. <laughs> well, too late, I guess. Overkill. <laughs> and here we are back at the charged soul core. All we have to do, do now is uh, take it. Yeah, we, we exa yeah, 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 Jimmy. Just take it. When, when they said weapon swap, I was like, it reminded me of Diablo 2 pressing W to weapon swap and yada yada. Oh, what the fuck? Don't die this time, guys. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the fact that it's just, you can choose on which ability it's, it should use nice. what weapon, is just, it, it, yeah. You don't have to bother automatically, like manually switching. Oh, you can okay. actually push her. Frozen, huh? Frozen, nice. How that we're both doing ice damage. Frozen? Frozen! Getting real lucky with those freeze procs this time. <laughs> All skill. <laughs> nice. Frozen.
Die! Why? Get away from him. Get away. Get away. Triangle. Oh. oh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Charlie. Nice. So that's Path of Exile 2. These areas, as well as around half of each of the first four acts, are available to play at the three demo zones around ExileCon. Oh. Now, if you're physically here at this event and you get to play the demo, just remember, it's a different game than before. It's a lot harder. You're probably going to run the first pack of monsters and just die. <laughs> I really recommend you read the signs. They have good advice on how to combine your skills effectively. And remember, dodge rolls on spacebar. Use it. <laughs> you're just going to die otherwise. So your next question is likely to be, when is the beta? Well, we're in our last year of development, but we're, and we're still finishing acts, adding skills, and balancing everything. The closed beta is going to start on June 7th, 2024. Oh. Part of oh. Excel 2 has been a long time coming, and we're incredibly excited to be near the finish line, but we're just not quite there yeah. yet. We're determined not to rush this and make sure we get everything right. In the meantime, there's a lot in store for we one I'll hand back over to Chris, and he's going to talk about what's coming up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, very good they're not rushing it. So that demo was very hard for them to do in person. Like, I am very impressed it went that well. So as Jonathan explained, Path of Exile 1 will continue to be its own unique game once Path of Exile no, there 2 hasn't comes been out. Any we will continue to update it with expansions and leagues going forward. And because accounts and microtransactions are shared between the two games, and their expansion releases are offset from each other, it's super easy to jump between them and effectively play both if you want. So I'm going off script for a second here and just going to explain this a bit better. Imagine we release a Path of Exile 2 expansion, right? So everyone dives in and plays it. You give it, say, out of the 13-week cycle, you're going to play for, you know, some hardcore players play for the first few weeks, some people play for most of the time. We're going to aim a Path of Exile 1 expansion to come out towards the end of that cycle, say four or five weeks from the end, which also lasts for three months. So because Path of Exile 2 has more content and is a significantly larger game, it's will mean that you can play Path of Exile 2 for the majority of the cycle, and then either keep playing if you want to keep playing Path of Exile 2, or jump into Path of Exile 1 when its league launches and enjoy that, either for the entire period or until the next Path of Exile 2 one comes out. And of course, because your purchases are shared, if you were to buy supporter packs or microtransactions in either, they're just available on your characters in the other. Huh. Speaking of Path of Exile 1 expansions, we've got one coming out in just three weeks, on August 18th. Let's watch the trailer for Path of Exile, Trial of the Ancestors. All right. Souls such as yours do not go quietly into the night. They thirst for battle. They yearn to prove themselves. Welcome to the Halls of the Dead. Earn your place among us. August. Under Hinikora's watchful eye, test your mettle against the greatest warriors who ever lived. Prove yourself in the trial of the turtle. Tattoos. Only one can become champion. 
will it be you? In the Karui afterlife, the fallen chieftains of each tribe participate in a tournament called the Trial of the Ancestors. You will journey to the afterlife, assemble your own team, and enter the tournament to battle those chieftains and earn valuable rewards. As you play through areas in the Ancestor Challenge League, you'll find tradable silver coins. Using them will take you to the Karui afterlife, where you will encounter Navali, who you may remember from the Prophecy League. Each coin allows you to play a match of the tournament. You start the tournament with a basic team consisting of three warriors. The tournament is double elimination, meaning you're allowed to have one loss without consequence. A second loss eliminates you from the tournament. Your team will compete against 10 other tribes, and you choose who you're going to challenge next out of the teams left in the tournament. When you start a match, you see the configuration of the enemy team and get to place your team of warriors on the battlefield to challenge theirs. You and your party of exiles will play alongside your warriors. So while this league does have many elements of an auto-battler, you're right there fighting alongside them. Okay. During a match, when a warrior dies, they respawn at their totem after a short time. If their totem is destroyed, then they are instantly killed and can't respawn. The team that destroys all of the opposing totems wins. If you're playing a hardcore character, though, don't worry. Hinakora, the goddess of death, is watching over you and will restore your soul to your body, so you can't permanently die in the afterlife. Like that. <laughs> in the trial of the ancestors, strategy and tactics are key. Every unit has its own strengths and weaknesses that must be utilized to win matches. The turtle is really slow and really tanky. It's perfect for either defensive positioning to stop flankers or offensive positioning to tank hits for you if you're pushing through the middle. It's not great in the center or flank positions due to its slow movement speed. The Tuatara is a quick and deceptive unit, which is relatively well balanced for all positions. This version of the Tuatara has a stealth ability, which makes it perfect for the flanking position to sneak through enemy defenses and take out unprotected totems from the side. The Goliath of Might is a disruptor unit, and it's ideally placed in a center position to intercept enemies that are chasing you. You can also allocate it to defenses sure, so that it disrupts right. enemies that are trying to kill your totems by stunning them. So in this match here, we've set up a Tuatara in a flanking position, a turtle on defense to guard our totems, and a Goliath to follow us as we attack up the middle. Our plan is to work with the Goliath to distract the enemy front line so the flanking Tuatara can get through and destroy some of their totems. Teamwork. <laughs> Upon winning a match, you earn favor and other rewards. I'll talk about the other rewards shortly, there are a lot. You have a separate amount of favor with each tribe, and you can spend it by talking to their chieftain to recruit warriors and purchase field items and equipment that your team can use. Each tribe has specific specialities. For example, Hinakora's tribe manipulates life and death. Rongo Kurai's tribe is slow and tanky, with an emphasis on stuns and knockbacks. You can recruit warriors from many different tribes and mix and match them together into your team based on what you need. Field items are items that are placed on the battlefield and can be activated during the match to, for example, revive a warrior or heal your entire team. If a field item isn't consumed within a match, it persists onto the next match, but your warriors, their equipment, and your field items are all wiped between tournaments. You enter each tournament fresh. Your success in a tournament updates your overall ranking, which helps you in better rewards and subsequent ones. Speaking of rewards, let's discuss the good part, what you can earn for succeeding at the trial of the ends. You can tell this gets me excited. Okay. <laughs> You get a reward as you win each round of the tournament, and these rewards are visible when you're selecting which tribe you want to play against. They'll help inform your decision, as some of them are regular rewards and some of them are, yeah. and some of them are exclusive new rewards you can only get from the Trial of the Ancestors. I'm literally tripping over my words to get to the part where I can explain tattoos. <laughs> okay. The Ancestors reward you with special tattoos that are not applied to your skin, but they're engraved on your soul. This process can transform what your attribute skills on the passive tree do, basically the attribute highway nodes generally. The regular ones can only be applied to basic attribute skills and allow you to convert your tree's attribute highways into something more useful for you. For example, this one converts a small dexterity skill into movement speed. 
Each tribe has its own exclusive passive tattoos. This tattoo converts a small strength skill into additional fire resistance. This one converts a small intelligence skill into additional lightning damage. And this one converts a small strength skill into one that summons a minion when you take a savage hit from a unique enemy. But don't go overboard on the number of skills you convert with tattoos, as you'll probably need at least some of your attributes left to equip items. <laughs> Each of the 10 tribes has an exclusive unique item that you can earn. These rarely show up as rewards for defeating that tribe in a match. Katava's Hunger is a unique majestic place that you can earn by defeating the Katava tribe. As you can see, it grants an immense amount of life for a single item, providing you don't have any life on any other pieces of your equipment. While this is tricky to accomplish, it also frees up all those other potential life slots to be something else that benefits your build, Vendor making it pure trash. upside. This amulet is a unique item you can earn by defeating the Arohongui tribe. It has the powerful effect of causing your flasks to instantly recover life and mana whenever you're low. This could potentially be a powerful instantly? panic button, or maybe you want to oh. build around permanently being on low life or mana, so all of your flask usage is instant. If you manage to win the entire tournament, you'll not only receive the reward for the final match, but Hinokoro will also give you a choice of three additional... Next. Sorry, button didn't work. Of three additional exclusive no, items. My eyes are Let's have a look at some of the things you may be offered. First up, there are four Contacts. unique items that exclusively come from Hinokoro for completing the tournament. This belt, for example, lists a plethora of really powerful properties, both beneficial and detrimental. While you're wearing the belt, the property shifts around every five seconds. Wait, what? You never know what's going to happen next. Will you always crit, always evade, never evade? Maybe you're able to find some ways to build around the detrimental effects to create as much upside as possible. Hinokora also has a selection of special, more advanced passive tree tattoos that you can only receive from her. This one transforms a 30 intelligence notable attribute skill into one that increases the level of all of your intelligence gems. You're only allowed one copy of the specific attribute combination tattoo on a tree. Hinokora can also award you with a new type of item called an omen. These are small items that sit in your inventory until a condition is met, at which point they are consumed and something happens. In this case, when you reach 25% life, your flasks are all replplenished. Now, don't worry, each player can only consume one omen Bro, per combat area, so you don't have any reason to fill your entire inventory with them. All these developers are. This one creates a portal on death. <laughs> we made it for me. <laughs> it won't try to save your life, but it will save you some time. This one grants you Soul Eater when you level up. It's definitely worth carrying around for that occasional massive power boost. Omens are tradable but hard to get, so use them carefully. I shudder to think about how much this one is going to be worth in the presence of those incredibly rare unique weapons from 320. Now note, going off script again here, back in the day when we had stuff like the Prophecy and so on that let you upgrade to rare forcibly on a specific base type, we had to block the good items by putting crap, rep, crap uniques on the, um, sorry, I meant upgrade to unique. Um, we put crap uniques on that base type so that you couldn't get it every time. Well, we stopped doing that. So a lot of the uniques that were upgraded in 320 um, are just the only thing on the base type. So items like this let you deterministically get something quite valuable, hence they are quite rare. The most exciting one, though. Finally, Hinokura can offer you a lock of her hair. This is a very special currency item that lets you foresee the result of using another currency item to craft something. This means, for example, you can know whether it's worth exalting your item because oh. you'll know exactly what the outcome is. Hinokura's lock will slot into your crafting pipeline with powerful consequences. The Trial of the Ancestors offers a wide selection of valuable new rewards as you complete matches and tournaments. We really look forward to seeing what strategies you develop for building, equipping, carefully placing, and playing alongside your tribe. So that's the new Challenge League, but Path of Exile expansions contain more than just a new Probably league every three months. In each update, we also augment Path of Exile's endgame and shift the metagame with new gems and balance changes. This expansion is no exception. I'm going to explain the other changes in a medium amount of detail. I'm conscious that we have both new and existing players. For new players, I'm going to try to include some extra content to help make the changes more understandable. All right. You can find out all the detail in the patch notes and other information we'll be posting in the few weeks before release. Let's start with how the Trial of the Ancestors expansion expands Path of Exile's endgame. In December last year, we released an expansion called the Forbidden Sanctum, which introduced the Sanctum Challenge League. This league was a roguelike game set within Path of Exile where you would randomly explore a randomly generated sanctum one room at a time alongside your regular play. 
You'd pick which rooms you wanted to explore out of several options and accumulate beneficial boons and detrimental afflictions that made your run easier and harder, respectively. Not only did Sanctum work really well as a league, but it also had the potential to be added to Path of Exile as part of its core endgame content, alongside systems like Mapping, Delve, and Heist. Huh. Well, in this expansion, the Forbidden Sanctum is back. <laughs> I've really been looking forward to this one. We're reintroducing the Sanctum as core content in Path of Exile's endgame. Pretty much that. You'll initially meet Divinia. I mean, the I Sanctum do have 140 hours in, in this 10. game. Sanctums are now tradable items that you can find while playing maps in the endgame. A forbidden tome represents a whole floor of the Sanctum, and its rooms can be played back to back, or you can take breaks between them and do something else if you choose. Upon successfully completing that Sanctum floor, the next floor is generated as a tradable item with all of the state of your Sanctum run built in. This means what? that the item stores what boons and afflictions you had, what rewards you've locked in, and how much resolve you have left. You can then either play this floor or trade it to someone else if it feels more beneficial. Okay. For example, let's say you manage to lock in a really valuable reward. <laughs> the example here is a mirror of Calandra, but you'll also notice that... Do I have a laser pointer? It doesn't work on the board. Okay, one resolve. Um, <laughs> this is an example here where the player has a very good reward locked in, but a massive pile of dangerous afflictions and only one resolve on them. If you don't feel capable of completing the rest of the Sanctum from this point, then it would normally be a write-off, right? If you gave this to me, no way am I getting that mirror. But you can now trade the Sanctum state to someone else who is willing to pay for the chance to earn the mirror or lose it. And it, That's you know, the you, rarest you item in the game. I know that. Right? It's worth some percentage of that mirror. So you trade it for like five chaos to someone, they run it and lose their chaos. <laughs> Your relics, which act as passive bonuses within the Sanctum, are locked in for the run when you start the first floor and can't be changed for the rest of oh, the yeah, run. Oh yeah, Ares got Speaking one, right? Relics, they're not <laughs> tradable and have been rebalanced That's around awesome. us. To those of you wondering, we have decided against bringing back Sanctified Relics for now. A complete Sanctum run now requires killing the final boss, Lycia, in both her first and second form. She will always drop a unique relic, and these have been reworked and replaced as we rebalanced everything. An important aspect of the new Sanctum balance is that your primary defenses now have some effect on protecting your resolve. Your armor allows you to mitigate resolve loss, and your evasion grants you a chance to avoid resolve loss entirely. Like a some lot people like how play armor innovation work. for thousands of hours, and they never see one. Your energy shield grants you resolve Aegis, which is a mechanic that works similarly to how energy shield behaves for life. In light of the new defensive opportunities and learnings from the original Challenge League, we've rebalanced the difficulty of Sanctum, especially and in any later enemy wars, in the game can drop it, right? Monster and room variety and you to kill thousands and thousands and thousands of enemies. Boss, we've added new boons and afflictions themed around the new defensive mechanics and have rebalanced many of the other ones. Like other optional endgame systems that involve tradable items, players Millions. who don't want to play Sanctum can trade their Sanctums to other players in exchange for an item or currency that benefits them more. Successful Sanctum play can generate a lot of rewards. It'll potentially be possible to build characters dedicated to Sanctum running and just farm Sanctums repeatedly in order to profit. Sanctum isn't the only improvement that Trial of the Ancestors brings to Path of Exile's endgame. We're also introducing 16 new Atlas passive at Atlas Keystone passives to the Atlas Passive Tree. As a quick summary for new players joining us, the Atlas yep. Tree is a system that allows you to customize your endgame experience in Path of Exile. As you, complete difficult, as you complete different maps, you gain skill points that can be allocated in the tree. You could use these points to modify the behavior of different content you encounter in endgame maps to make it more difficult or more rewarding or to behave entirely differently. The system allows you to double down on the content you enjoy and avoid content yeah, you don't. Yeah, this is the Atlas tree, yeah, not the skill Keystones tree. are really impactful oh, passives that totally change your in-game system's behavior. Usually, <coughs> usually they have an element of give and take and require you to come up with new strategies to take advantage of them. Each of these 16 new Atlas Keystones changes how you might interact with Path of Exile's endgame. Let's have a look at some of them now. We will reveal the rest of them in, before the release of Trial of the Ancestors in a few weeks. Extreme Archaeology completely changes how you play Expedition Encounters. Instead of, replacing, instead of placing a series of regular explosives, you now place one gigantic explosive. <laughs> every single chest or monster in the blast radius is affected by every remnant in that radius. <laughs> 
Speaker okay. of the Dead makes it so that tormented spirits can possess you rather than possessing monsters. <laughs> Boosting your stats instead. While possessed, you can touch monsters just like a spirit can, making them stronger and more rewarding. It's, it's kind of getting silly at this point, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Blight is like a tower defense minigame inside Path of Exile. The Cassia's Pride Keystone makes it so that Blight monsters take significantly less damage from players and significantly more damage from Blight towers. This basically lets you go all in playing like an actual tower defense game. Because we can. <laughs> Lucid Dreams makes it so that Val side areas in your maps are no longer corrupted, meaning that you can use currency items to change their mods. That's right, when you encounter a Val side area, the keystone lets you craft it. <laughs> yeah, so we rebalanced the side area mods, we've improved reward outcomes, and we've made the downside mods a bit more punishing, you know, just to make it interesting if you try to go for the good outcomes. You may also rarely encounter a unique Val side area. Destructive play makes it so that the Maven will summon between one and three extra random map bosses when you are fighting witnessed map bosses. This keystone is analogous to the Eldritch Altar keystones that make those influences more difficult but more rewarding. There are another 11 new keystones that we'll reveal over the next few weeks. It's Together, these 16 keystones mean that regardless the, like, of how you enjoy your maps, you'll have, they have plenty made of all new ways work. to play Path of Exile's endgame in this expansion. And I should note, in the initial draft of the keynote, I painstakingly went through every single keystone. It took like 10 minutes. <laughs> but we'll put them in the news to save you some time here. In the Trial of the Ancestors expansion, we're shifting Path of Exile's metagame in several ways. So the first is by introducing 14 new support gems, which are designed to take existing categories of skills and provide entirely new ways to play them. For full information, check the final gem hovers when we post them in the next few weeks. Let's have a look at a handful of these support gems now. In Path of Exile, war cries usually buff your party but don't directly hurt monsters. The Corrupting Cry support gem turns war cries into damage dealing skills by making them inflict corrupted blood on monsters affected by the war cry or by your attacks that it exerts. The Returning Projectiles support gem causes projectiles from supported skills ah. to return to you, piercing all targets but dealing a little less damage. Wait, arrows too? I think there's another example what too. What the fuck? The fresh meat support gem causes minions created by supported gems to gain adrenaline, critical strike chance, and critical strike damage for a duration after they're first summoned. So you've got to work out a way to keep refreshing your minions, and it makes them a lot more powerful. The Flamewood support gem Whoa, causes totems what is to that cosmetic? projectile mortars at enemies that hit them. Holy! This is particularly synergistic with totems that can taunt enemies, such as Decoy Totem, or one of the new Chieftain Ascendancy skills that I might talk about shortly. The Sacrifice support gem works on spells that you either cast yourself or through totems. These spells now sacrifice a percentage of your current life or the totem's life to gain additional chaos damage based on how much life was sacrificed. The Frigid Bond support gem affects Link skills what the hell? and causes a cold mist to come over them. Enemies caught in the beam are chilled and are dealt cold damage over time. This creates a new tool for a cold damage over time build requiring <laughs> what the hell? strategic placement <laughs> of both yourself and your Link's ally. I mentioned it was going to get silly. <laughs> The Locust Mind support gem looks OP and affects attack skills that use bows and wands. Instead of directly using the supported skill, you throw mines in an arc that use that skill for you, targeting your location when you detonate them. In addition to these gems, there are another seven that we'll be revealing over the next few weeks. In addition to the 14 new support gems, our balance work for the Trial of the Ancestors involved us revamping two Ascendancy classes. These are the subclasses that you can specialize in as you play through Path of Exile's campaign. Each main character class has three ascendancy classes available. In the last expansion, Crucible, we overhaul the Pathfinder and Saboteur. This time, it's the Guardian and Chieftain, which are specializations of the Templar and Marauders, respectively. While we were very happy with the theme of the Guardian, it was falling behind the power level and popularity of other ascendancy classes. Our changes in this expansion have modernized the class and will present you with more relevant build opportunities than before. Brace yourself. Okay. 
Path of Exile 102. Harmony of purpose can power up parties using link skills. Time of need now completely cleanses and heals you every four seconds. Radiant and Unwavering Crusade both fully embrace the Holy Summoner theme by giving you access to some exciting new types of minions that are exclusive to this Ascendancy class. We have this picture on the announcement page, pathofxl.com slash ancestor for you to scrutinize. Next. <laughs> While the Guardian's revamp was similar to that of the Pathfinder, the Chieftain has received the Saboteur treatment. To be honest, we were unhappy about many aspects of this Ascendancy class in its old form, and so we have completely redesigned it. You, you can play it now. Hey, it's basically an entirely new Ascendancy class with the same name and art and a new way of approaching its themes. Its new skills let you, among other things, cause enemies to explode, turn off enemies' fire resistance while you're stationary, convert passive skills to apply to fire damage, and have your fire resistances apply to your cold and lightning resistances. I'll just give you a sec more to read. <laughs> All right, that's on the site too for you to check out. It's pretty powerful now. Green, five years. To celebrate the release of the Trial of the fast, Ancestors, man. we'll Thank be hosting a boss kill dude. event. To enter, oh. create a hardcore solo cell phone character in the Ancestor League and race to kill all seven uber pinnacle bosses on the same character. Okay. Note that unlike the last event we ran, this one is not a ruthless event. We'll post more information about the event and its prizes in the news before release. Best of luck What does ruthless mean? For the Ancestor Challenge League, we're launching two new series of supporter packs, the Shade and Disciple packs. Each tier contains the pack's full face value and points, Hard alongside mode. several okay. exclusive microtransactions. These packs are only available for the duration of the Ancestor League and will leave the store forever when it ends. As always, the microtransactions in these packs are purely cosmetic and do not affect the character's power or progression in any way, despite how cool they look. The Shade series of supporter packs contains six exclusive microtransactions. All right, the sarcophagus back attachment imprisons an unspeakable so evil cool. that struggles to break free. Nearby monsters send it into a frenzy and enemy deaths provide it hey, with souls you. to feast upon. Uh -huh. The Stygian waypoint shackles visitors to your hideout in chains, yourself included. These chains are just cosmetic though and they break as soon as you move. It would supposedly be a gameplay advantage to be able to imprison people. <laughs> The ferryman's armor set is so full of trapped souls that some of them try to escape. Moving while wearing the boots will leave souls in your wake trying to break free. Huh. Oh, the infernal see. portal opens a gate to the nether realm when you approach. This prompted a lot of internal discussion about whether using hellfire to heat your hideout is actually safe and practical. The demon-bound crafting bench allows you to enslave a malevolent entity to craft Whoa, items for you. Be warned, fucked. it has a sharp tongue and will mock you mercilessly. You chained me for such a paltry use. The nebula character effect causes items you pick up to orbit you in an ethereal cloud of loot. Whoa, wait, what? Oh, that's sick. <laughs> The Disciple series of supporter packs also contains six exclusive microtransactions. Look yeah, at you dog. can have pets hey. too, right? <laughs> I'm going to put that in the top pack. <laughs> the Hero's Landing finisher effect summons a marble statue from the heavens to execute unique monsters you defeat. You decide whether it's the sword or the huge lump of rock that actually kills them. The Bell Tower map device heralds the opening of a new map with a peal of bells. Start to run out of portals, though, and it will reflect your desperate situation. <laughs> this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> the cathedral armor set reflects li refracts light through your character, creating beautiful patterns on the ground around it. If your life gets low, it responds in kind. The Observer Diamond Flask summons a tentacled mass that fires its eye lasers at enemies you critically strike while the flask is active. Again, cosmetic. The Currency Orb Charge Effect lets you pick from a number of different currency types to replace your charges with, as long as you've used that currency item any time from today onwards. Some people... We we have to store oh, it in the database, right? Some people you'll, will, be, will show they can be part of the exclusive club of players who have actually used the Mirror of Calandra. Oh, that was the Mirror, yeah, okay. also causes your charges to display in town. So the theory is you go use your standard Mirror, <laughs> which we all have, right? <laughs> the Faithful Hound Pet is a very good doggo, and it knows a few tricks. 
you can command it to sit, roll over, or play dead. And yes, you can pet the dog. Ah, of course. <laughs> Dude, they're having so much fun with this game. These new packs are available right now at pathofexile.com slash purchase, and purchases like these directly fund the ongoing development of Path of Exile 1 and 2. Meanwhile, the Lithomancer and Enchanter packs leave the store forever at the launch of Trial of the Ancestors. You can so tell how excited he is. Them. There's some good stuff in those too. Thanks for your continued support. The fun part. For the last <laughs> XLCon, we developed a special card game that encapsulated the full gameplay arc of Path of Exile over the course of the event. Players could defeat monsters, progressively upgrade their items, use currency items to craft their equipment, find and run maps, and eventually defeat pinnacle bosses to earn rewards. It was a whole lot of fun, and we've, we've had so many requests to run it again. So this year, we're proud to bring you the 2023 version of the Exocon card game. And like all Path of Exile expansions, it even includes a challenge league. <laughs> In your swag bags, you'll have found a box of Exocon cards, and then a gentleman outside will have asked to purchase them from you for real money. <laughs> if you have any cards left, <laughs> you can use these to challenge GGG staff members who are walking around Exocon as monsters. Uh -huh. They'll be oh, wearing nice. t-shirts showing the monster's stats, which include symbols for their attack and defense. Using the cards in your deck box and those you accumulate by defeating monsters, put together one set of armor, one weapon and shield, or a two-handed weapon, and an amulet and two rings. To defeat a monster, the damage on your weapon has to be equal to or larger than the defense of the monster, and the defense on the armor and shield have to be equal to or larger than the attack of the monster. It's that simple. There are some wild card symbols. It's explained on the rules in the box. Rings and amulets are pretty hard to find, and they can be used for either attack or defense. So to attack a monster, politely approach a staff member wearing the shirt, introduce yourself, and show them the set of equipment you want to use. If your symbols match, then you'll have defeated them, and they'll give you a reward and remove some of, your, of the durability from your items. They do this by clicking the card, so if you want to keep the card pristine, don't necessarily attack someone with it. It will get damaged in combat. Um, be careful not to waste your best items on low-level monsters. You're not allowed to attack the same monster twice in a row, so you need to explore Exocon to find different GGG staff members. You can get maps by defeating monsters marked as gods. Take these maps to the map device to run them and progress through the tiers. On the back of the box is a list of quests. As you complete quests, you can visit the crafting bench on the top floor to receive rewards for completing those quests. While you're there, you can also use your currency items to modify your equipment. I mentioned that this year's version of the card game introduced a challenge league. That league is Delve. Accumulate sulfite and bring it to the Delve wall. I'm sorry for the bad photo, it's hard with lighting, <laughs> on the middle floor. Each sulfite card you hand in allows you to explore one tile of the Azerite mine. You'll all be working collaboratively throughout the event to delve deep into the mine, fight the monsters that this lurk is there, so and cool. uncover its treasures. And I feel really bad for the poor people that had to hang 3,000 cards on that wall. <laughs> Is it 3, you may eventually be able to challenge the pinnacle bosses if you manage to get really far in the card game. I'm the Searing Exarch, Jonathan is the Eater of Worlds, and Mark is the Maven. Defeating any of the three of us will reward you with a Mirror of Calandra enamel pin. This pin is exclusively available for winning the card game and won't be sold in the merchandise shop. Each oh. person can only receive a maximum of two mirrors, and when they run out, we can't give any more out, so try to win the game early. The reason for two is a very typical Path of Exile reason, one for you and one to trade. <laughs> All right, it's almost time to go and experience Exilecon 2023. Aside from the card game, we've prepared a full weekend of activities for you. There's a busy roster of talks and interviews on the main stage and the streamer stage. We've posted a schedule at pathofexile.com slash exilecon, so you can see what is happening when and where. The schedule also includes information on meet and greet sessions. Our special guests this year include a roster of many of your favorite streamers, but also some game development industry friends we've met over the last 16 years. We're proud to once again welcome the creators of the Diablo series, David Brevik, Max Schaefer, and Eric Schaefer, as well as Travis Baldry, who you may know from Fate, Torchlight, and his popular fantasy books, or even the books he's narrated. They'll not only have meet and greet sessions, but are also participating in an action RPG roundtable discussion alongside me and Eric tomorrow on the stage. In all of the developer talks and panels, Exocon attendees will be able to scan a QR code on their phone to submit questions for the speakers to discuss in the panel or on the Q&A section of the talk. 
The path of XL2 XLCon demo is a large one, and you may want to play it multiple times this weekend. In each session, you can pick from one of four character classes, which start at various points throughout the first four acts of Path of XL 2's campaign. Around half of each act is included in the demo, and your session time is limited to 45 minutes before you have to let someone else have a turn. Remember, as Jonathan said earlier, this demo is hard. Read the signs that explain how your skills combine together. Dodge roll is your new friend. You should also swing by the Path of Excel mobile demo at the chill out area on the top floor and check out its oh. progress. It's coming along really well, and we'd love to get your feedback on it. We've created heaps of new Path of Excel merchandise, which is available at our merchandise shop on the middle floor. We've made 17 new t-shirts, which include a few from our community t-shirt design competition. We've created a range of 24 enamel pins. You'll have found a random one in your swag bag. If you approach me and I'm wearing a pin, feel free to swap for the one you've got if you'd like, happy to trade. Ah. We can purchase, you can purchase the others in the shop. As mentioned before, there's also the super exclusive Mirror of Calandra pin that is only available to winners of the card game. Maybe you're able to trade for a full set. There are two new posters. One is the Atlas Passive Tree, and the other is the Periodic Table of Currency. <laughs> In addition to reprinting the incredibly popular Celestial Cat socks, we've also introduced the Chaos Orb socks, better for business meetings. <laughs> There's also a range of four desk pads to keep your play area tidy. Nice. You can check them out at the demo zone. We have a limited range of XLCon 2019 merchandise available in the store as well. Make sure to head it up early if you want some of this, because stocks of the older items are quite limited. We have plenty of new merchandise for everyone, though, and I think I might have underestimated that. The Exocon live stream concludes tomorrow with our grand racing finale, where four players compete for up to $10,000 and the title of Exocon 2023 racing champion. Afterwards, we're hosting an after party at 8 p.m. at the venue. If you're watching from home, please note that because there are multiple things going on at the same time here, and we can only stream one of them live, we'll be restreaming three of today's talks tomorrow before the event starts. So to be clear, they're occurring here, people can watch them in person, but you can't watch them at that time because we're streaming something else. So we're gonna restream those tomorrow in the three hours where it's way too early to do it in New Zealand, but you can watch them online from the States and Europe. This makes sure that everyone is fully up to date on all of the talks that have been announced about Path of Exile 2 before the important Q&A in the morning where you get to ask the important questions. If you missed out on attending ExoCon this year, we'll be at Gamescom in Germany in August and PAX West in Seattle in September. At both shows, the Path of Exile 2 booth will have our ExoCon demo available to play and a small team of Grinding Games developers, including me and Jonathan, to chat to, and we hope to see you there. Thanks so much for joining us this weekend at Exocon 2023. Have a great show, everyone. That was very good. Uh, yeah, no, Miss Lucy, no MMOs, no. Thanks for the 18. Nima, thanks for the 9. Spice, thanks 21. Green, thanks for the 61. 1.5k hours played on stream and probably even more with the old lamp chip. Never so seen a mirror in the game. Yeah. The second half, the post stall cast. That was good, man. Uh, that was good. Oh, you want to listen to this? Have a bit of a chat about what we've seen so far, and there is a lot to go over while we distract you while we wait for the next upcoming segment, which will be Kuperian interviewing Jonathan about Path of Exile 2. So until then, though, let's have a little bit of a chat about some of the things we've Path seen. Path of Exile 2 looks uh, very good, yeah. Why don't we good, off with yeah. the separation of Path of Exile 1 and 2 into uh, separate games and uh, what that means. What, do you guys have any thoughts about that, Mathel? Um... Yeah, apparently they didn't own enough of my soul. So, like, <laughs> instead of just, you know, playing as much as you want of um, Path of Exile League, a few weeks here or there, uh, you know, maybe half of it, something like that, and then maybe do some other things. Instead, you're pretty much locked in a cycle of playing both versions like, now. It does so much for a presentation. When and I'm just going to be doing that, basically, for the rest of my <laughs> life. So that's that's the big... Um, when a developer is so me, uh, uh, that, passionate about it. It's amazing, and yeah, nothing short of what I expected. Awesome. Rise? I got to say, I was thinking that that's the right path for Path of Exile, uh, and I mentioned it to a couple people, and they were all going, nah, no, there's no <laughs> way they're not doing that. Even developers were like, mm, we're not telling you anything. <laughs> Turns out, they're doing it. So, like Mathel said, I think uh, there's plenty to be played. And You don't play this shit and get really hyped? Time, yeah, it's just, nice schedule it's like they're talking like alien weeks, language, but it's, like, uh, it's, it's still so enjoyable to listen POE to, because you can tell they're excited about it. Expansion, so I'm really looking forward to that. Nugi? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, pretty exciting. Uh, 
I, I, I'm not sure. Like, you're still getting PoE 1 and 2 at the same time, just in PoE 2. True, and true. all upgraded. So it's not we're going to have this weird split between 1 and 2. You're just getting it all in one package with enough content to... Like, just... I know, I yeah. saw that. Yeah. I think them separating the games the way they are does answer a lot of questions about, like, how certain PoE 1 things might have changed over to the new system yeah. and PoE 2 and yeah, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of expected that this... Like, this isn't super unexpected, but what was really unexpected oh, God, for me King was the fact that they're keeping up with Path of Exile 1 expansions as well, like mm. this split cycle. Like, I did not expect that in a million years. I don't think anyone did. Yeah, yeah. I thought PoE 1 was done, you know? It would just go Legacy and you could go, go back and play the old content if you wanted to, but... I didn't realize there was going to be new updates to that. That's good. That's a lot of work for them. They're basically going to be splitting their office into two teams at that point. And Tomorrow early stream, uh, I got to get Jim in. But after sure that, I, I just want to play... Um, bigger and better from here as well. Because <laughs> for the past you know, few years, they've been working... I, uh, I just want to do uh, Dragon's Dogma, uh, yeah. And, you know, diverting less of their resources towards the PoE 1 so, yeah. leagues and all that. They I don't know when I'll be live, but after that, yeah. I'm going to see the reviews on Path of Exile. Close to overwhelming. If it's like never live, Gaddon, I can follow it. Sure. There you go. You happy? Um. Stop adding me. 